speaker, very seasoned speaker with us, uh, Dr. Meenashi Sundaram. He will be speaking on anesthetic management of obstetric hemorrhage. And in the PG corner, we have uh, PGs from Malabar Medical College, Calicut. And they will be speaking on the cricothyrotomy set and, dope, and the drug dopamine and dobutamine. And that will be by the Dr. Masa Sulfikar and Dr. Bijina Bharadan. And you all know that we have the coordinators of this uh, PG update, starting from the national president, Dr. Venkatagiri, Dr. Rajesh MC, Dr. Vijish Venugobal, and Dr. Binil. Isaac Matthew. And we have the presence of uh, uh, Dr. Venkatagiri here and also our state president, uh, Dr. Shamsad Begum. Over to you, Madam, for the official welcome. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, respected National President, Dr. Venkatagiri, uh, State Secretary, Dr. Paul O. Raphael, our academic coordinators, Rajesh, Dr. Vijesh, and uh, Dr. Binil, and all senior um, ISA members, my dear colleagues, friends, and uh, dear uh, PGs, a warm good evening to all. First of all, I welcome today's uh, may, uh, speaker, Dr. Minachi Sudhara. He doesn't require any introduction to any of us, as well as all of the members of the ISA, ISA as well as all the medical colleges. And he is the presently he is working as the director of the medical education Tamil Nadu. Formerly he was the dean of the government medical colleges, various medical government medical colleges of Tamil Nadu. And he is a very good speaker, orator, uh, and he is also uh, interested field. His uh, interested fields are cultural activities as well as even in poetry, and he has. The, he is a very well renounced person in all the activities, the, um, academic activities as the extracurricular activities. And uh, I am really obliging to serve for today's program because in a very short time, we invited him for this program because uh, 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 this is our last academic program of the present uh, administration of uh, ISA. Kerala. So I want a very renowned person and I think we have selected the best person that we can uh, approach. Thank you very much, sir. And at the same time, a warm welcome for you to this program. And for the today's PG corner, we have uh, the students from the Malabar Medical Colleges, Kolkod, and uh, uh, the Dr. Ravi Kumar, Professor of Anesthesiology, will be the coordinating the section. And uh, uh, the students are Dr. Muzar Zulvikar, Asir Zulvikar, and he will be presenting on equipment cricothyrotomy set. And uh, for the uh, drugs, dopamine and dobutamine by Vijna Bharatan. And once again, I welcome you all for this academic session. And um, over to Dr. Venkatagiri, our national president, to few, say a few words. Giri. Thank you, President. Uh, DME and uh, friends, I said DME. Uh, yeah, this is a new thing. And uh, as you said, that uh, lucky that we have Dr. ALM today for the uh, CME, that your last CME, I think, in your term as the president. And uh, we had a good activity on the alternate weeks we had and uh, uh, faculties. And the new thing we, in your period was the PG corner where PG studies in the topic done uh, very well. Hope it will continue in the coming year also. And uh, new team will take that. All the best. And uh, we wish to hear from Inakshi and me talking long. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Paul. Yeah. Over to Dr. Rajesh for the Thank official you. introduction of our main speaker, Dr. Thank Minar you, It's a very difficult task to introduce someone who is already known to everyone. Minakshi Sundaran sir doesn't need any introduction. He's the current DME state of Tamil Nadu. 
is a renowned academician and not only he's a man of letters in not in tamil tamil nadu i have seen his many literary works uh, he has sent me many literary works even he has uh, uh, given a lecture on tirukkural i i think it should be uh, the part of curriculum for all post, all uh, undergraduate students in pan india it's a wonderful uh, this thing uh, literary work he has written and uh, he's a renowned speaker in anesthesia Yeah, you cannot imagine any academic activity in india without uh, the presence of minachi sundaran sir as a faculty member so today he is dealing with a very important <coughs> session for the post graduates for the theory exam as well as for their clinical practice and for the practicing anesthesiologist any practicing anesthesiologist cannot shy away from obstetric anesthesia it's their bread and butter but 90% of the time it will be it will go as smooth as uh, spinal anesthesia and patient will come out uh, as well as the child will be okay but 10 times it is uh, 10% of time it is panic and this 10% of times we have to show our nerves and we have to okay, we have to be the real captain of the ship and we have to guide the surgeons and other persons in the ot and make sure that the patient is safe throughout the perioperative period over to uh, minyakshi sundaran sir for a, for delivering in a very important lecture and uh, thank you so much uh, sir for accepting our invitation for the uh, probably the last uh, uh, lecture series in the isa pg uptake by the present office bearers thank you sir thank you once again and over to you sir <coughs> thank you uh, isa kerala uh, see at the outset i am very happy that uh, i am speaking i should not call me as a last speaker for this uh, session because there is no sad note to be attached everyone is seeing is the last 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 see you should feel proud in saying that you have conducted a session very well because i also know organizing a webinar is very very difficult when it is a continuous uh, phenomena which we are also doing in pudukote uh, budan it is all the more difficult and i should congratulate you that you have successfully conducted the pg corner because 78 members are attending even at the beginning of the program it is a great success uh, for you because any webinar with the only 50 members it is a big success and all your post graduates are interested they welcome uh, this thing so you should feel happy that you have done a very good work for so many years in your term and hope i will also do the justice and i will try to deliver a lecture memorable uh, in your mind so thank you sir it is not moving is it yeah changing sir yeah yeah that's right so the med, as uh, dr rajesh pointed out this uh, obstetric hemorrhage is a leading cause of uh, maternal mortality everyone knows and even according to the world health organization 25 to 30% of maternal deaths are occurring even now so now the advances in obstetrics mainly the interventional radiological technique have helped in uh, solving this uh, obstetric hemorrhage and at the outset i want to say a multidisciplinary approach will be helpful in managing a case of obstetric hemorrhage i want the post graduates to listen just because i am interested in the pg teaching i want to make it so simple at the same time i will tell the complicated uh, things also for the simple reason they need not practice it in the setup but at the time of writing the examination they have to write this can be tried but it is not widely practiced so you should know that also so <clears throat> i want to say the obstetric hemorrhage everyone knows obstetrics is a bloody business not the obstetrician i am talking about the obstetrics the field it is a bloody business even according to cunningham and why we bother about this obstetric hemorrhage if i see a falls like this it is a scene of beauty so i should appreciate it everyone will enjoy it but if the same thing is a downpour of blood then it is a terrific sign 
everyone is uh, worried that is a problem so we bother about obstetric hemorrhage so what is obstetric hemorrhage this is only for post graduates the obstetric hemorrhage is defined if it is a sudden blood loss greater than 1500 ml or blood loss greater than 3000 ml in less than 3 hours many definitions are there see blood loss of 150 ml per minute in 20 minutes so you multiply 150 by 20 it will work out to 3000 ml only but they give so many definitions and till you pass your exam post graduates they have to remember the definitions once you pass the examination then see you need not be <clears throat> struggling like this with a lot of headache how to remember these definitions or you need not scratch your head like this monkey by seeing so many definitions because once you pass out the post graduation the clinical utility of these definitions cannot be validated in routine practice that's what i want to say so till you pass the examination remember this definition but once you manage practically these definitions will not carry any point in managing the case so as a consultant also i am saying as a teacher also i am saying so you should know the difference between the two see first you have to write the obstetric hemorrhage differs from the regular hemorrhage it is not a road traffic accident hemorrhage that is different see at the initially you may think both are hemorrhage in what way obstetric hemorrhage differs see at the outside both sides the heads may look uh, alike but if you see carefully there are a lot of differences between this side and that side that happens in obstetric hemorrhage also i will tell you why obstetric hemorrhage differs from the routine hemorrhage see blood loss routinely 1000 ml blood loss is very common in uh, deliveries so it, there is a difficulty in estimating the exact blood loss that is the problem first point and it is challenging to the anesthesiologist as it is sudden and rapid at least road traffic accident even though it is a sudden rapid hemorrhage you can anticipate but it is challenging because it could not be anticipated and the more than everything the most difficult part according to the practitioner not to the post graduate managing obstetric hemorrhage is easy but managing the obstetrician is very difficult because she will interfere in your work by crying or raising a hue and cry so as a practitioner you have to manage the obstetrician also so the obstetrician see before joining og as a pg she will be like this definitely as a young age college going she will be like this but once she become a obstetrician and becomes a surgeon she will act like this with the anesthetist mainly if there is a pph she will be asking the obstetricians have what had happened what had happened why there is bleeding you push oxytocin you push methargin what are so many things she will say but before that she would have been a quiet so you have to understand after uh, passing out og during pph routinely they will be violent but in pph they will be more violent so you have to note that as i said there is a difficulty in exact blood loss estimation because the blood loss it is diluted by amniotic fluid so you may be thinking that the patient has lost 2000 ml but 1500 ml may be amniotic fluid that is very difficult to assess and loss may not be revealed if it is intra uterine or rupture uterus intra peritoneal or retro peritoneal it is very difficult to decide the pg has to write that so it differs and high clinical expertise is needed to detect the obstetric hemorrhage why there is a difficulty in early diagnosis usually we say in any hypotension according to mary's law there will be tachycardia but in pregnancy itself will produce tachycardia not only to the pregnant mother to the obstetrician to the anesthetist also there will be tachycardia so the tachycardia and svr cannot be taken as a clue to determine the shock and hemodynamic collapse occurs rapidly because of supine hypotension syndrome in addition to that if the bleeding occurs there will be a sudden collapse and there is a delay in intervention to control the bleeding why there is a delay if it is a highly sophisticated center there will be so many drugs blood bank interventional radiology everything will be available but obstetrics is practiced worldwide from a small taluk to the highly sophisticated center so every center will not have a intervention to control the bleeding 
and another point there is a high utero placental blood flow it is nearly 12% of the cardiac output so the patient succumbs to the blood loss very fast and again there is a inappropriate clinical evaluation which i have said and you cannot investigate also investigation also is difficult so there should be high degree of suspicion because blood loss is mixed with amniotic fluid so you have to suspect and see there is a inability to recognize the risk factor and a failure to recognize leads to high morbidity and mortality that is a problem with the obstetric hemorrhage so to easily remember the obstetric hemorrhage you have to remember four t's with a cup of tea so the tone tissue thrombin and the trauma if you remember these four t's you can write what are all the causes of obstetric hemorrhage i will tell you one by one so t for tone tone is pph previous pph prolonged labor big baby these are all the obstetricians will tell you there is a predisposition to postpartum hemorrhage and if it is a tissue it is a retained placenta or membrane or clot thrombin why is it thrombin there is a problem with the coagulation it can occur in abruptio placenta in pih help syndrome if there is a iud if there is a amniotic fluid embolism this is due to thrombin and the trauma it may happen in normal delivery as lacerated perineum or it may happen in cesarean section so there are chances of vaginal and cervical tears and a uterine rupture so if it is antepartum hemorrhage now this uterus is smiling because if there is a trickle of blood but in antepartum hemorrhage it starts as a trickle but it bleeds profusely so the antepartum hemorrhage can be due to abruptio placenta placenta previa uterine rupture but these cases in antepartum period they can be diagnosed by ultrasound so ultrasound not only helps but confirms even concealed hemorrhage like retrouteral clot or intraperitoneal collection everything will be seen by ultrasound and ultrasound is the commonest investigation which they do in the antepartum period if it is intrapartum so if it is intrapartum it may be due to abnormal placenta or uterine rupture it may be due to low lying placenta or due to previous lscs or uterine anomalies intrapartum it can occur then as placenta previa and fetal mal presentation it may even happen secondary to induction by oxytocin so antepartum can occur intrapartum can occur so the abnormal placenta may be placenta accreta and increta again as i said if there is abnormal placentation it can be diagnosed by antenatal ultrasound so a planned cesarean section with the consent at the same time we have to be ready we have to prepare the patient also for obstetric hysterectomy and we have to make arrangement of blood and the blood products in adequate quantity so the abnormal placenta in intraoperative blood salvage if possible can be done but in obstetrics intraoperative blood salvage is not done the pg has to write intraoperative blood salvage could be done in select population but it is not widely practiced i will come back to it later and if it is a uterine rupture in the intrapartum period it is a life threatening emergency uterine rupture because it associated with the higher maternal and perinatal mortality usually it happens in post cesarean pregnancy or neglected labor so what is the obstetric management fetal delivery immediate delivery and if it is a small rent it rent closure can be done or without wasting time we have to go for obstetric hysterectomy and if there is a facility now this uterine and internal iliac arterial ligation is helpful which can be practiced everywhere this is done in the pre operative period by interventional radiologists blocking the uterine and internal iliac artery by balloon tamponade done by pre radiologists in the pre operative period but in the para operative period obstetric hysterectomy will save the life ah uh, the without wasting the time routinely what happens they will be closing 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 patient will be continuously bleeding they will be transfusing lot of blood four to five units then they will resort to hysterectomy at that time patient may be in a state of shock and because of massive blood transfusion patient has later complications so now the question comes if it is a antepartum hemorrhage what anesthesia we have to give because the routinely 
the post graduates will be asked the question and the post graduates will ask the teacher what is the choice of anesthesia regional or general so in one word if you if i want to tell i can't say that is the answer but in the examination pg should not say i can't say they have to say it depends upon the individual patient so it depends on the hemodynamic stability of the patient if the patient is hemodynamically stable we can go for spinal or epidural provided other contraindications are not there and if the patient is unstable then we have to go for a general anesthesia because managing the airway and ventilation will help in resuscitation of the patients in shock so hemodynamic stability present it is central neuroaxial blockade there is no hemodynamic stability unstable patient it is general anesthesia now comes the main part postpartum hemorrhage see the postpartum hemorrhage if their bleeding is more than 500 ml in 24 hours or 10% decline in hemoglobin it is a postpartum hemorrhage so the postpartum hemorrhage can be primary if it occurs within first 24 hours routinely the anesthetist will be em, uh, engaged in this first postpartum hemorrhage only and the secondary occurs 24 hours to 6 weeks post delivery there is a period of pure perium mainly it is due to atonia of the uterus it is mainly due to atonia of the uterus so early administration of uterotronic tonics is important in managing postpartum hemorrhage now what is the uterotonics we can employ so that the uterus will become a um, gym worker just like a gym worker uh, so first the oxytocin can be tried so the oxytocin routinely see now because of the anxiety of the obstetricians and because of the instructions from the obstetrician i can say it is not advice it is instructions a lot of oxytocin is pumped in but it is also having problem so we have to note that 20 to 30 units in one liter fluid can be given at the rate of 60 drops per minute the problem with oxytocin is it causes vasodilatation so produces a fall in blood pressure it is a negative ionotropic agent so we have to be very careful stt changes in ecg will be seen with oxytocin so as the duration is short we have to give as a infusion and methyl ergometrin see if a k question is asked routinely nowadays methyl ergometrin is not used the pg has to say methyl ergometrin is nowadays not used because of fear of coronary spasm that is a problem and if the patient is suffering from pah or hypertension complicating pregnancy this methyl ergometrin will increase the blood pressure and it produces nausea vomiting headache but it comes as a uterotonic drug so you have to note that because as a practitioner you can use methyl ergometrin in a diluted way in examination i am again i repeat you have to say as far as possible methyl ergometrin is avoided because of fear of coronary spasm and a hypertension and now they are using prostaglandin analogs so misoprostol can be given it can be given as a suppository rectal or oral and sublingual usually the suppositories can be administered rectally and urethrally and vaginally here the vaginal administration is contraindicated as everyone knows when there is a profuse bleeding the suppository cannot be inserted per vagina but you have to note the shivering and the transient rise in temperature is common with the misoprostol carboprost can be tried so it is 0.25 mg intramuscular maximum is 2 mg and now some obstetricians are using it intramyometrially but intramyometrial use is not advised now they say it is off label use the off label use is not advised medico legally so we may be but off label intramyometrial use anesthetists will not use but even if it is used if it is mentioned it will medical legally it will be wrong but this carboprost causes bronchospasm hence it is contraindicated in asthmatic patients even terrible death has occurred because of prostaglandin administration in uh, uh, asthmatic mothers if everything fails drug fails then you can go for bimanual compression of the uterus or the uterine massage then Bielinch suture, these are all for completion sake and the PG has to write. But we are worried about this balloon tamponade and surgical iliac or intraneal ligation or interventional radiologist role. 
in any bleeding you have to decide obstetric hysterectomy this is a diverse of the uterus from the mother decide early use judiciously the blood and the blood components then t for trauma trauma occur any time delivery or lscs or episiotomy then the small large severe cases these are all only for uh, uh, examination uh, purpose we have to decide what is the hemodynamic compromise the patient is undergoing we have to manage according to that so in obstetric trauma in addition to the management you prevent infection and a septicemia so in the trauma if there is a uterine inversion that is also a trauma immediate replacement of uh, uterus you should not remove just because the uterus has been inverted the we should not remove the placenta or the obstetrician cannot do that first it has to be pushed inside then only the placental removal is to be done because the hemodynamic instability will be very severe in uterine inversion and for this lot of inhalation agent is needed no amount of your see people think by giving uh, saxamethonium the uterus relaxes i want to inform the post graduates it is a skeletal muscle relaxant for the uterus to relax you have to use only inhalation agent which is a smooth muscle relaxant you have to know the difference because most of the time the obstetrician will ask for the beginners i am telling because many obstetricians have asked me why while you were intubating with the saxamethonium why not you do it with uh, for a manual removal of placenta they will demand us to give saxamethonium but previously we were using uh, halothane any inhalation agent you have to pour a lot of inhalation agent so that the uterus relaxes and another cause of uh, maternal hemorrhage obstetric hemorrhage is coagulopathy coagulopathy may be coincidental or it may be due to the obstetric process like abruption or ph so sometimes pph may be the first indication for uh, von willebrand disease so it may be incidental or it may be a cause so if there is a von willebrand factor deficiency you have to give a factor you have to replace the factor with the ddavp and if you want to practice the central neuroaxial blockade it should be more than 50 international units we have to keep in mind so in retain placenta as i said it has to be removed only with the inhalation agents so how to go about pre anesthetic evaluation it is by hemoglobin and pcv that is the main but blood grouping and cross matching is to be done don't say that i have to go for x ray chest i have to go for ecg that and all not needed immediately you require a hemoglobin level and the coagulation screening and you have to ensure availability of whole blood and blood products and because in india even now the chronic anemia is there we have to check uh, the erythropoietin level we can even try recombinant human erythropoietin this is only in the preoperative period and not in the acute uh, setup then coagulopathy can be diagnosed by coagulation profile as i said or a tag thromboelastogram or rotum should be done in a uh, sophisticated centers so then what you have to do you have to assess the intravascular depletion as i said the bleeding it is very difficult to define how much the patient has blood so the only the hemoglobin and the pcv will be contributing they will not confirm the diagnosis so the clinical suspicion is important we cannot over treat also because massive blood transfusion is a complication so if there is a hypotension or if the heart rate is 120 you can think of uh, blood loss but the heart rate 120 even the anxious mother pregnant mother it is presumed that it is less than 120 but in a state of shock this urine output will definitely help so if the clinical sign by which you can diagnose the hypotension if it is asked in the exam you have to say urine output less than 0.5 ml per kg per minute so if it is a sep well equipped center then the interventional radiology suit this you have to mention in the present day setup because they are doing a very good work if a massive hemorrhage is anticipated they are doing a balloon uh, tamponade or angiographic occlusion of the necessary blood vessels then we can operate very easily even for uh, myomectomy uh, they are uh, using this technique so the interventional radiology suit of the pgs have to go and see at least what they are doing 
so in the intra operative period if it is bleeding there is a pre operative period you can go for uh, uh, interventional radiology but in the intra operative period you have to take care of a actively bleeding mother so it should be based on algorithm i want to say the algorithm should be locally made it should not be a western standard because the algorithm in tanjavur may be different from algorithm in thrissur so you have to formulate your own algorithm and it has to be given a sanction by the local branch so that uh, tech, legally also it will be valid and a multidisciplinary approach mainly a hematologist if he is there it will be always beneficial instead of we reading so many things and the hematologist will be very much helpful if the bleeding is due to coagulation disorder but whatever happens in obstetric hemorrhage there should not be any communication gap because communication is vital as uh, i used to say see in the boys hostel instead of a wifi they have mentioned a free wifi available so there was a lot of crowd in this uh, hostel then only they know there is a mistake it is not only this is uh, in india but don't think that the western people are wise they are otherwise that's what i want to say see this is uh, can you guess what is happening here it is america the kansas city is in america they have mentioned it welcomes 25 million visitors annually so that is a problem instead of annually they have given a communication like this so this sort of a communication gap should not be available in the intraoperative period if there is a obstetric hemorrhage so the maternal resuscitation how you are doing in the intraoperative period if it is a minor bleeding we can manage with the crystalloids but always if there is a bleeding you gain intravenous access with the 14 gauge cannula now the pg has to know because they are routinely using 18 gauge cannula with the green they should know there are 16 gauge available 14 gauge available if you say me i will use 14 gauge cannula the next question will be from me is what is the color of the 14 gauge cannula so this is 16 and a 14 gauge cannula you should know 14 gauge cannula will be orange in color and 16 will be somewhat it is a whitish blue these cannulas you have to see before telling it in the examination so first you start a crystalloid infusion if it is a massive hemorrhage because continuously if it is bleeding you cannot measure whether it is a 1000 ml or not you cannot do that so if you clinically if you think it is a massive hemorrhage immediately you take control of airway breathing and the circulation then give oxygen by mask because once the hemoglobin is lost you have to increase the dissolved plasma oxygen concentration so you give oxygen these are all paraoperative period so the intravenous access you have to secure two 14 gauge cannulas or central venous catheterization flat position keep the mother warm that means whatever fluid you administer it should be always warmed warming is necessary or else the cold crystalloids and the cold blood will produce more problem and complication for the mother so ask for blood so infuse up to 3.5 liters of crystalloid then sometimes in the emergency usually blood is uh, administered by the blood set which is having a filter but this filter will not will affect the speed of the blood the access that is very difficult it will go very slowly so in exam you are not supposed to say that unless or otherwise the examiner pokes you whether you will use blood filter then how will you use so you have to use some compression equipments if you are using a blood filter or you can use a set where the blood filters are not available as they slow the rate of infusion then the recombinant factor 7a should be based on coagulation studies here only the hematologist helps what to monitoring you will do only bp will be seen the monitoring will be mainly the color of the patient and the urine output and here i want to say even if you transfuse lot of blood even if the patient's hemoglobin is normal it will take some time for the patient to recover the same color so the urine output and so the correct thing will be the capillary refill time you have to check temperature because cold temperature will produce more problem and if the patient is in shock invasive blood pressure monitoring will be helpful whatever it is done time should not be wasted for lab results because if you ask for a coagulation profile it will be taking minimum 30 minutes 
so that is a problem and every um, hospital will not have a facility for this uh, thromboelastograph or uh, rotum so you have to go for volume replacement immediately so you have to inform the examiner i will not wait for the blood uh, lab results i will send the for the results but i will not wait so the first thing what you have to do is a red blood cell concentrate is the first solution you have to use so what is your aim in replacing that you have hemoglobin greater than 8 don't aim 10 or 12 because that massive blood transfusion will produce more problem like trolley so platelet count 75000 because less than that the dilutional thrombocytopenia because of lot of slide or collide it will produce dilutional thrombocytopenia which can produce bleeding so ensure platelet count of 75000 and keep the prothrombin time less than 1.5 of the control aptt also same and the fibrinogen level, if it could be monitored, it should be more than one gram per liter. So the controversy of the fluid and blood blood products, it's a problem. So what I want to convey the single point, the nature of fluid infused is of less importance, actually blood for blood. So you have to transfuse first blood, inform the examiner, I will ask for blood. Till that time, I will use crystallide. Once blood comes, mainly I will ask for red blood cell concentrate, then I will be using. But whatever you give, rapidly you have to give and it should be warmed. These are all the two things, practically. Rapid administration, warm. Rapid administration is possible here, even if the three-way stop cannula, they will push. But warming is all the more important because cold blood, if it is transfused, it will produce more complications. Whatever it is, always have a plan B. If you are using uh, blood, if blood is not available, what do you have to do? Because if one is not available, you have to pick up other. So always you should have a plan B. And I will tell the important, first go for RBC. Second go for uh, crystallite, it is a uh, ringer lactate, 2 liter. Third you go for fresh frozen plasma. This is based on the availability, I am telling a practical clue. So FFP, four units for every six units of RBC. And the last is the colloid because this colloid is not beneficial even if you give because some people, they think the blood pressure is maintained so they will be using uh, colloid. But crystalloids is equally effective. So the first choice will be RBC. Ask for FFP or platelet concentrates. They are cryo precipitate till the time you use crystalloid. This is a method. So you have to use platelet. Say you have to use platelet if it is less than 50,000. You have to use cryo precipitate if fibrinogen is less than one gram. And if it's a large volume, then think of DAC, whether it is large volume of crystalloid or large volume of blood, it will produce coagulation problems. So the empirical treatment with one liter of FFP and cryo precipitate can be given till you are waiting for the coagulation studies. This is a recommendation by the British committee. I am using 111, but I, why I am not telling my standard? If you say British committee says everyone will accept. If it is said by Meena Jusundram, no one will accept. So you say the British committee recommendation is one FFP and two cryo precipitate packs. Empirically, replacement therapy if rotum or tech is available because it will be helpful. It will, rapidly you will get the results also. Another problem by blood transfusion, the patient may become normal acutely, but the adverse effects with the blood transfusion you have to think in mind. It produce because mainly trolley transfusion related acute lung injury, other uh, transmission of infection problem. Cost is increasing. That is a problem mainly in India and a monitor for complications. So you monitor because there may be rebound hypercoagulation. If it is there, if you suspect a thromboembolism, use graduated stockings or low molecular weight heparin. Even though the patient has been resuscitated from uh, bleeding, you have to again use a drug which will prevent the clotting. So because pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. Another point, Routinely in obstetrics, we say there are two lives involved. So in a maternal bleeding is severe, 
we have to think of baby also because this nap i have taken in my place tanjavur see the mother is wearing the helmet but she is leaving two of her uh, daughters unprotected it should not happen in uh, maternal resuscitation we have to take care of baby also so baby if the ultrasound monitoring you can do fetal scalp ph or fetal scalp lactate even if it is delivered you have to check the fetal ph so you can improve the placental perfusion by appropriate oxytocin regimen and if the patient is fetal distress oxytocin drip is to be discontinued in the pre operative period then this is for uh, exam purpose blood conservation strategies are used only in uh, cardiac surgeries so can you examiner can ask you can you try autologous blood transfusion in anticipated bleeding mothers it is not done routinely because already the mother will be suffering from anemia and you cannot predict how much of a blood has to be harvested in the pre operative period so it, it is not done routinely it should not be done routinely but the exception for everything the exception is a jehovah's witness who steadfastly reject and refuse the blood transfusion so you can try that for those people same way the intra operative cell savage is used in cardiac surgeries but it will be contaminated with the fetal red blood cells and amniotic fluid so it is not practiced in obstetric hemorrhage again it can be practiced or it can be tried only in jehovah's witness that is the only thing then the recombinant uh, factor 7a therapy you have to consult a hematologist that will be always uh, better because originally it was used for uh, hemophilia this factor 7a should not be used if the fibrinogen uh, level is less than 1 and the platelet is less than 20 because it will act only if there is adequate platelet and fibrinogen so you, if you are not having the facility to do that don't employ these drugs because it will not work in low fibrinogen and thrombocytopenia and anti fibrinolytics like tranexamic acid see when the patient is bleeding very heavily this tranexamic acid will not be useful but the pg should know this anti fibrinolytic drug uh, which will ensure clotting is available it is not used in obstetric hemorrhage so the carry home message will be the role of anesthesiologist in the management of obstetric hemorrhage is crucial that we have to note we have to work so this is a female carrying a male so this message is for females so now the message for male male carrying a female various guidelines available for management should be incorporated in a local protocol we have to manage like that this is a practical message and as i said there is a multidisciplinary approach so the multidisciplinary approach many people will be carrying the management so the consensual planning is necessary see however much the specialty people come into play the anesthetist has to take the lead role no other way because he is good at resuscitation so the take home message will be in multidisciplinary approach men may come and men may go as it is obstetrics women may come and women may go but anesthetist has to face all the pressure and not the pleasure that is a problem only we will be suffering but we should not take it as a suffering it is our responsibility because we are trained to do that so i have to thank isa kerala and i am very happy that i know many people in kerala because of the frequent visit i am really happy because of the frequency of visits i know many people in kerala than in tamil nadu uh that is the thing that is the reason why when you call me kerala is a home away from home uh so i accepted and i am very happy that i could be photographed with many people in uh, uh, kerala so i thank isa kerala and i thank i hope you may be relaxed but i am thanking this uterus also because this is uterus is contracted very nicely so i am safe i don't know whether you are relaxed or tensed up thank you very much in between you have put my photo also i would like to see that slide again i i don't know what is that you have put my slide in between <laughs> you are whether whether well good comment bad comment i do not know but you have put my photo there <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir for the great lecture and i we truly appreciate your effort and time taken 
in preparing the lecture and uh, you are also very dear to the uh, isa kerala and for the students from not only in kerala but throughout india and uh, now the session is open for uh, comments questions from the senior faculties as well as from students please yeah before that uh, i asked i asked dr rajesh okay dr. sir i asked dr rajesh to send me his photograph with me and he said i don't be photographed with a very very lazy <laughs> people <laughs> <laughs> so he has not sent that he say i i cannot take a photograph with you are you no sir it's not like that <laughs> as is uh, yeah yes sir uh, dr joy joy yeah. yeah yeah thank you so much rajesh and uh, paul and shamshad uh, begum madam and meenakshi sudram always i have heard this lecture so many times so i know which line will come after what Excellent lecture as usual. Vikram Kiri sir, you are also there. Namaskara. <laughs> so, uh, just a few points from my side. Sir has covered the full thing very nicely, uh, especially for the prior practitioners who are practicing in the various nursing homes, maybe small or little bigger. If you get a patient of placenta atrita, you must always know which type of placenta atrita it is, because in small nursing homes, getting blood, blood products, monitoring is most difficult. So, such patient should be. definitely shifted to a little higher tertiary center if you get a case of placenta percreta that is when is involving the including the bladder we do a lot of cases because it's a tertiary hospital and we get patients from all over the place with placenta percreta the placenta percreta we have devised uh, operation by our gynecologist after it is published in his in the journal of obstetrics not anesthesia obstetrics in which they do trans aortic clamping and uh, then uh, they you uh, up before For uh, transaortic clamping, they do a midline uh, classical uh, cesarean section. They get the baby out. They don't remove the placenta. So then they do the transaortic clamping because this uh, interventional radiology doesn't work in those conditions because where the bladder and not the placenta is practically involved in all the structures. So they do a transaortic clamping and then they remove the uterus with the placenta and the bladder which is involved in the urology is there. They do a partial cystectomy. So in those cases. You have to be very careful. We have done maybe I don't know more than fifty up till now, and it is a published work. In cross aortic clamping, you have to be very careful. You have to have a you need not have a central line, but at least a peripheral line, which, which uh, Sir said either a sixteen G or a fourteen G or two eighteen Gs. But a arterial line sometimes is useful because when you do the cross clamping of the aorta, there will be a, a loss of uh, venous return from the pelvis and the legs, and you get a short, very a uh, sharp uh, drop in bp but that bp is good to do the uterus the bleeding is hardly anything though it still bleeds but uh, this uh, just uh, just telling a few lines about this it sir has already covered but a little extra beyond uh, uh, the routine uh, obstetric hemorrhage which we face fantastic lecture sir thank you for allowing me to speak thank you sir for any comments comments any senior faculties in the dr mubarak is there and uh, you can unmute and uh, give your comments please anyone please hello yes. hello i am audible or not yeah you are audible yeah good evening everybody uh manashi sundaram lecture is always a treat to watch and almost covered everything uh hello good evening dr meenakshi sundaram to add this now with the sir sir good evening the need to students of anesthesia Good evening, sir. Your your talk your talk was nice. You covered. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Almost every obstetric population, obstetric area. <laughs> so nice to hear. And in between, I was busy, so I could not uh, hear it in a continuous way. That's why I was not able to come in. So you yeah, have yeah. partly escaped, sir. You have partly escaped. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, nice to see you, sir. Thank you. Sir. 
So there is like a question. What 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 is the role of interventional radiology in pre post? Sorry, in in pre and post period. Yeah, in pre operative period. I think it is in a pre operative period. Okay. The interventional radiologist is playing a very good role. Very good role. See, you have to select the patient. If suppose the patient is suffering from placenta previa or placenta accreta, then they will selectively block the vessels supplying the uterus. So you have to select the people who are prone, whom you expect to go for a massive obstetric hemorrhage. They will block the vessels and they will hand it over to you in a avascular uh, plane. So you can easily operate or else if the bleeding is there, it will be very minimal only. That is a point. In the intraoperative period, it is very difficult. Uh, some question is there in the intraoperative period also. See, in the intraoperative period, the, the anesthetist has to resuscitate <clears throat> and if the interventional suit is nearby, they have to transport the patient. If the suit is nearby, they have to transport the patient, which is not possible in all the areas. As I said, the obstetrics is practiced everywhere, everywhere and the interventional centers will be very hardly one or two in uh, metropolitan cities. So slowly it has to come. So in the pre-operative period, they'll be helpful. In the intraoperative period, if you shift and all practically, it will be a problem. Uh, sir, thank you very much for thank a you. nice talk. Uh, and uh, As always. Uh, I have forgotten to tell you once, one, I want to clarify one question. And I have forgotten to tell you regarding the Budkote Budan. I think that you have covered about more than 30 now, isn't it, sir? Yes, sir. 30. Yes. Then, uh, my um, doubt is regarding the fibrinogen level in PPS, if whether it's still it is uh, fibrinogen level less than one gram or if it is less than two. Madam, uh, actually, suddenly your voice uh, was broken. Uh, so please res repeat the question because you want to know why you wait for one and why not less than two. That is your question. Yes. Is it? Okay, okay, yeah. that's all. Fibrinogen level. That's all. Ah, this is the thing. See, Anything, if the uh, person is securing 90% and slowly he is going to fail gradually, we allow him maximum possible level. The okay. thing is, the factor 7M will not work if it is below 1. one. Some category, so the 2 is going to be the normal level. And because of our uh, massive resuscitation, patient will definitely develop dilutional thrombocytopenia and fibrogen level will go down. Because see, patients will be pushing ringer like it like anything because of fear. Uh, that is the thing. So we allow okay. the maximum. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, sir Pratish, I... any more questions? Sir, you are mentioning about the usage of black Doctor. side versus uh, without using, uh, without filter and with filter. Yeah. Uh, so could you please explain once more, sir? Sir, if the blood is usually Sir. administered with a filter, that filter will always reduce the rate of infusion. That we agree. Always it reduces the rate of infusion. See, now you have to weigh the pros and cons. I was very clear in telling, as a postgraduate, he has to say, I will use a blood set with a filter, but I will use compression equipments because we can give that pressure infuser system we can use even to bypass. But if there is a massive hemorrhage, don't think that it is going to produce complications. See, we have to select between the devil and the deep sea. So the practical point I am saying, you use a set without a filter so that it will flow fast. It will flow fast because most of the time we will not have 14 gauge cannula. We will be using 18 cash cannula only. I am saying practical points also. See, it is very easy to say, even in expected cases, we will not have 14 gauge cannula because it will not be available. It will not be available. They will have two. Not, eight not available. Yeah, it has to be available. In my area, wherever I work, it will be available, 14 gauge and 16 gauge. So that the, at least the postgraduates will know the color of the cannula. <laughs> brown cannula and orange cannula. See, previously they were using 12 gauge for cholera. That 12 gauge is outdated. So, 14 gauge, see, the, as we know, according to the passage law, the linear fluid level, if the diameter is doubled, the flow will increase 16 times. It is uh, 2 to the power of 4. So, it is going to be increased like anything. It has to be used. But uh, these filter sets, it will definitely slow the rate of infusion. Thank you.
sir dr majwa is funny uh, he wanted to speak ma'am may, uh, may i ask something yeah. ma'am i just want to add majwa uh, dr majwa you should not uh, talk uh, while driving <laughs> <laughs> no no it's on the speaker also sir it was a wonderful all can you switch off the video and speak uh, dr bajwa your voice is breaking probably because of traveling uh, nice so, to uh, hear you right <laughs> sir now it's audible audible now yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i have stopped the car uh, i will you not stop talking uh, yeah sir just want to cut <laughs> yeah yeah uh, just want to add here <laughs> you switch off your video then it may be better audio may be better he is equally handsome like you why you are asking him to switch on the video but he is not handsome like you sir sir is there a role for local administration of anti yeah is there a role for local administration of anti fibrinolytics uh-huh. which have recently come out in the present circumstances with the competence is is you no know, fine uh, the voice is fine yes 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 ah yeah, now it's clear better yeah sir i just want to add here that with the present competency based medical education in our institutions it's always better to have a classes of obstetric pgs and uh, nsc pgs together so as to form a very good team right from the beginning that's the way we should go forward because in the coming days all the medical legal hassles and all the even uh, logistic things are here very important so that they should learn right from the beginning of their post graduate career and that will be helping in management of such cases coming to the private practitioner what i say that anesthesia people always suffer in the last so what they can do any practitioner is handling at least four or five centers maybe more than that but it's the responsibility of the anesthesiologist also to guide how to arrange the logistic in case of any hemorrhage that occurs during the peripheral surgeries so that whenever the things are activated the anesthesiologist don't have to shout for the blood rather he will be the part of team he know how to carry out the things so i think that is the best way in both side the post graduation as well as the practices to handle the logistics as well as the coordination of the team which you have already mentioned in the your the first second second slide only the multidisciplinary approach that's only want to add sir hello question the question thank is you. thank uh, you dr bajwa this question okay. is this local uh, administration of anti fibrinolytics it will not be useful first uh, we will straight away answer that it will not be useful uh, and somebody dr irfan wanted to unmute him he wanted to ask some question uh, hello hello good afternoon hello yeah, irfan is online hello good evening sir good evening sir i am from kashmir uh, actually i am a senior resident anesthesia tell me sir i have two questions one question is is there any added advantage of using carbitocin over oxytocin for the uh, prevention of pph and my second question is uh, is there any uh, method of uh, like practical method where we can infer of starting blood transfusion in a patient uh, or in an obstetric patient like is there an hb level or any other method of uh, using that we can use for starting blood transfusion in a in a patient obstetric patient like uh, while going for lscs is there any method or is no, there I, a... could not, i could not get your second question sir uh, my second question is is there a, a value of hb like transfusion ah. trigger for starting ah, correct, or is yeah. there... correct. i got the point i got the point now i will answer your first question whether okay. carbitocin is preferable than oxytocin carbitocin can also be tried both are going to act in the same way but the carbitocin is a newcomer uh see it is just like if meenakshundaram is not good call dr samshit madam so if oxytocin is not good you call carbitocin but in our field experience will have the weightage but in pharma a newcomer will have the weightage that is the only thing so carbitocin can be tried even in jovially i used to say a uterus which is not contracting to oxytocin may contract to carbitocin the reason being the uterus is used to this oxytocin it has seen several oxytocin drops so suddenly if carbitocin comes the uterus may be confused some new molecule is coming so it will contract even out of fear or out of action so carbitocin can be tried if oxytocin fails no problem in that and again this question this hb trigger or um, uh, that the trigger is usually we cannot uh, go by this hb trigger but uh, hb gives you the idea 
See, if the patient preoperative blood level is 10 gram, and suddenly if it has become 8 gram, we know the patient has lost a sufficient amount of hemoglobin. That is the reason why I said the hemoglobin level alone doesn't matter. I even in my talk, I said it should be always coupled with the PCV. HB, PCV. So don't write, never write HB. If you write, write HB, PCV, practically that will be helpful. As you are a senior resident, whenever you write, you write HB and PCV because there is no point in checking only the hemoglobin level. We have to check the RBC mass also, which is carrying the hemoglobin. In turn, hemoglobin will carry oxygen. So it is not a trigger. The trigger which should be from our brain and from clinical expertise only. All the other things are only guidance. As I said, we should not over-treat because of uh, fear about uh, massive blood transfusion. So if hemoglobin 8 is okay for our uh, standard, because less than hemoglobin 6, uh, the complications will be more, which we have seen. So instead of waiting for 6, we are keeping the target at 8. At any point of time in management of obstetric hemorrhage, don't exceed 10. That, that is your overshooting. Dr. Murugesh, any comments? Dr. Murugesh. Hello. Dr. Murugesh, you can unmute and give your comments. Okay, now if there is no. Yes, raise the hand. Uh, doctor, yeah, yeah. If there is no comments, we will go to the, can we go to the next session? Meenakshi sir, thank you. Yes, once thank again. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very again. much, sir. Thank you. Thank, from the bottom thank of you. the heart, from the all. Thank you very much, sir. And from thank the you. students thank of you, Kerala, ISA. Yeah. And for, uh, for your valuable time and uh, for preparing the wonderful lecture. I will be listening also, the postgraduates. Thank yeah, you. Sir. Okay, thanks. Dr. Vijish is there. Dr. Vijish is not there, sir. Dr. Binin, please take over. Now, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. And now we'll move on to our next session. That is our PG corner. And I welcome uh, representatives from uh, Malabar Medical College. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mashar Sulfikar, PG resident oh, from Malabar Medical College, will be presenting. Pronounce it as Mashar. And uh, Dr. Bijina, right? Dr. Bijina Bharadan will be presenting dopamine and dobutamine. And to coordinate the session, I think Dr. Ravi Kumar is available. Dr. V, you are available here? Dr. Ravi Kumar. You are available, please unmute. So if he is not available, I request actually Dr. Dr. Paulo Rafael, our own secretary, to coordinate the session. Okay. The, the moderator was uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar. I don't know what has happened to him. Uh, sorry, good evening. Ah, yeah, yeah, Ravi. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, okay. Speak on. Yes, I wish. I'm uh, a bit busy with some case. I'm extremely sorry. Ah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. You can, you can start. You can start. Yeah. So, uh, actually, welcome, Dr. Ravi, please. Yeah, myself, Dr. Ravi Kumar, uh, Dr. Mazar, now for PG from Alcohol Medical College, is going to present the trichotherapy set. Uh, but that he's going to speak around uh, some 10 15 minutes. So I think it's the most important topic for everybody when can't integrate, can't ventilate. In such a situation, how best we can proceed? That's the one we are really aiming. So I think now I'm asking my Dr. Mazar to present it. Dr. Mazar, please take over. Thank you, sir. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the ESA Kerala chapter for giving me the opportunity to present a class uh, here. And uh, my share a screen, Mazar. Now you will be able to share, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, it's visible. Yeah, 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 it's visible. Have you have you opened two devices? There is a echo there. If you have uh, opened, please close one. Uh, actually, only one one I have connected. Only one system I am using now. Okay, okay, continue. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I am myself, Dr. Mazza Zulpikar. I am first year junior resident, uh, Department of Anesthesiology, Malabar Medical College, Calico. Here, I am going to present the topic, uh, Trichothyrotomy set. I will move to the topic. It is uh, emergency front of neck access. That is, uh, these techniques we will be using in the situations which we cannot intubate, cannot ventilate the patient. That, uh, and these techniques may be used as a primary airway in some difficult cases like uh, indications I will come in uh, the slides later. That is the indications like any, uh, any with a patient with a laryngeal neoplasm or critical airway obstruction. Sometimes if we think that the intubation is not possible, we'll think, uh, we'll think that it as a primary concern of access to airway. And uh, there are many options for the front of neck access and the, uh, the, uh, it being includes one transtracheal jet ventilation. And the other one is trichothyrotomy and the third one is tracheostomy. Tracheostomy will be usually performed in an elective basis by a surgeon. And what anesthesiologists will be uh, performing will be one transtracheal jet ventilation and also trichothyrotomy. And trichothyrotomy. Trichothyrotomy is an invasive technique that will provide access to airway in situations mentioned like cannot intubate or cannot, cannot ventilate. So this trichothyrotomy is given in the ASA, that is American Society of Anesthesiologists, DAA, difficult airway algorithm. If we are not able to intubate or not able to ventilate, we can think of some invasive airway access techniques like uh, front of neck access and trichothyrotomy is the one which we will usually perform in the uh, FOMA, that is front of neck access. And uh, we have to know that this trichothyrotomy is not considered as a permanent airway. It is just in the difficult situation, we are providing a temporary airway to maintain the uh, ventilation of the patient. After that, uh, either we have to remove the uh, trichothyrotomy catheter or we have to think of an elective tracheostomy, which will be done as an elective procedure. And indication, what are the indication for trichothyrotomy? That is, uh, during upper airway obstruction with the uh, inability to ventilate or inability, uh, we can't intubate the patient in that condition. Otherwise, if we are anticipating difficulty in our intubation or we are taking prolonged intubation attempts means, that time also we can think of trichothyrotomy and any procedures involving the upper airway. That is, in trichothyrotomy, the surgeons will have a vision from mouth to the till the vocal cord no uh, hampering of vision by the normal ET tube will be there in trichothyrotomy. So some procedures involving the upper airway also can be an indication for trichothyrotomy. And next, it is the patient with a cervical spine injury. We know that cervical spine injury intubation will be a difficult step. That is, uh, we have to do by MILE technique, manual inline stabilization of the spine we have to do. And in cervical spine injury, we know that we are not allowed to extend the neck for uh, easiness of intubation. So in that cases, without extending the neck, it is possible to do trichothyrotomy. So if you are not able to do intubation in a cervical spine injury without extending the neck, we can think of the trichothyrotomy also. And contraindications. Contraindication, there is only relative contraindications. That is, this is life-saving procedure during the difficult situation. So there can't be any absolute contraindication. The relative contraindication being children below six years of age. Pediatric population, we don't prefer the uh, trichothyrotomy because uh, children below six years of age or uh, the, tri uh, the, trichoid cartilage, the trichoid cartilage or the subglottis will be the narrowest portion of the airway in the pediatric population. So the, uh, the trichothyrotomy per se will be difficult in a pediatric population. Also, the isthmus of the thyroid will be reaching the trichothyroid membrane and injury and complication will be more in the trichothyroidomy than in a pediatric population. So, pediatric population trichothyroidomy is considered as a contraindication. And other causes are intrathoracic airway obstruction. That is, the airway obstruction is below the level of glottis or intrathoracic. There is no point in uh, securing a trichothyroidomy. We won't be able to 
adequately oxygenate the patient. Other than laryngeal fractures or neoplasm, if present, the trichotherapy will be difficult and it is a relative uh, contraindication. And other like subglottic stenosis or coagulopathy. Coagulopathy patients, uh, there will be immense bleeding and the, co the complication will be more in case of patients with the coagulopathy. And others is distorted neck anatomy. And uh, distorted neck anatomy, that is obese people or uh, if the patient is having any previous surgical scars or strictures during burn or previous injury, anything if present and we are not able to visualize the trichothyroid membrane means it is a relative contraindication. That is, we won't be able to do the trichothyroid membrane uh, incision. In that case, we have to extend, we have to put a vertical incision uh, around length of 8 to 10 centimeter and we have to do the blunt dissection. After that only, we will be able to find the trichothyroid membrane and we will be able to put an incision over that. And complete airway obstruction. That is, during trichothyroid we are putting the tube in the trichothyroid membrane and we are uh, ventilating the patient. The exhalation will be normally through the mouth or if it is complete airway obstruction means the exhalation of the air won't be possible uh, in a trichothyrotomy patient. So uh, it can be overcome, overcome by the trichothyrotomy tube, we will connect a Y connector and in Y connector one link will give the oxygen, pressurized oxygen through the one link and the other link of the Y piece, the exhalation of the gas will go to the atmosphere. And patient with a decreased pulmonary compliance. That is because we are giving uh, jet ventilation or uh, oxygen, we are giving at a higher pressure. So, patients with a decreased or pulmonary compliance will be, they will have more chance of barotrauma and the pulmonary condition will be wor uh, get worsened for that patient. The two most common techniques for performing a trichothyrotomy. It is one, it is percutaneous dilatational trichothyrotomy and the second one is surgical trichothyrotomy. There is one more not, uh, known as simple method known as needle trichothyrotomy, which, will, which I will mention later. The most common one is percutaneous dilational and surgical trichothyrotomy. Here we know that the anesthesiologists usually prefer the first one, that is percutaneous dilatational trichothyrotomy, because the steps of that uh, percutaneous dilatational one will be uh, based on the Seldinger technique. That is, we know that uh, while doing the central venous cannibalization, we'll put uh, a guide wire through the needle and we'll pass the cannula or the uh, catheter. So that method will be familiar for the anesthesiologist. So that is preferred by the anesthesiologist. But now the popularity is regaining for the surgical trichothyrotomy method because it is faster. That is, we can perform it faster and also higher reliability for the surgical trichothyrotomy cell. And first, uh, I'll uh, take a percutaneous dilatational trichothyrotomy set. In that, we can see we'll have a syringe with a needle for puncturing. And then we'll have a guide. Uh, I hope that you are able to visualize the arrow which I am pointing in my screen. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And uh, I have a guide wire and I'll pass the guide wire through the needle uh, to the person. And then I have a I'll have a scalpel. Scalpel for... Uh, for increasing the side of that is for passing the dilator, we have to increase the uh, incision size. So for that, one scalpel will be there. And uh, this thing, uh, dilator, dilator or introducer for uh, making the opening dilated in order to pass the whichever tube we are uh, planning to pass, whether it is trichothyrotomy uh, tube or tracheostomy tube. And a dissector, uh, artery forceps for if any blunt dissection is needed in case of uh, distorted anatomy. If we are planning to do a dissection, we need a uh, blunt dissector also, artery forceps also. Percutaneous dilational technique. As I said, the basis for this procedure is Seldinger. That is insertion of an airway catheter over a dilator which has been inserted over a guide wire. So here we will be using 18 gauge needle catheter. Uh, that is, it is connected to a syringe which is filled with the fluid. That is, uh, at the airway, if we aspirate the air, the presence of air, we can confirm that it is inside the trachea. That's why we are using fluid filled syringe. And uh, because of the location of the trichothyroid artery, we will be performing the trichothyroid membrane puncture in the lower one third of the trichothyroid membrane. And we will uh, angle the needle towards the caudal end. That 30 to 45 degree caudal end will uh, puncture. That is to uh, decrease the injury to vocal cord or the trichothyroid artery. 
and that uh, aspiration of the uh, free air will confirm the position that it has punctured the uh, punctured the trichothyroid membrane and it has entered the trachea this is the uh, the needle with the catheter is advanced into the trichothyroid membrane and you can see that the angle angle is 45 degree placed caudally and it is in the lower one third of the trichothyroid membrane and the catheter we will leave in place and next one we will be able to the we will pass the guide wire through that needle we will remove the gamma and we will pass the guide wire through the needle 2 to 3 cm inside we will guide it and we will hold the guide wire and we will be we will uh, remove the uh, needle then we can pass the introducer or the dilator through the guide wire and we can make the hole adequately large in order to pass our tube which we are going to pass and then we can pass through the airway tube and then we can uh, remove both the guide wire and dilator and we can fix the trichothyrotomy tube which has passed through the trichothyroid membrane by means of suturing if, uh, if, uh, if possible we can do suturing and we will fix the this thing and we can connect to the etco2 or capnography and sustained presence of etco2 will confirm that the position of the trichothyrotomy tube that it has entered the trachea and it is ventil adequately ventilating the patient advantages of the percutaneous dilatational method as i said uh, the anesthesiologist are familiar with this method seldinger method so it is uh, will be familiar with it and it is safer in case of cervical spine injury as i said it is uh, it can be uh, regarded as the first airway access in case of cervical spine injury and disadvantage means more chance of complication is present with this method and uh, uh, when compared with the catheter over needle method it is having less chance of correct positioning and uh, the position uh, while passing the airway tube it can change the position and it can go to uh, that is it cannot it it will not enter the trachea and it can uh, lead to incorrect positioning of the tube and the second one surgical trichothyrotomy and i said uh, now it is gaining popularity because it is faster and more reliable method and uh, there are many techniques for surgical trichothyrotomy here i'll be discussing on the scalpel bougie technique that is uh, defined by the difficult airway society guidelines and there are some uh, steps and equipments mentioned in the scalpel bougie technique that we'll see equipment first what all equipment we need to do the scalpel bougie technique that is number 10 scalpel blade is required bougie with an angle tip and cuffed and tracheal tube which with the lowest diameter that here we will be using 6 mm internal diameter and uh, lubricant to lubricate the endotracheal tube because we have to pass the tube through the bougie so for the uh, easy passage through the bougie and also to the trichothyroid membrane uh, we need to lubricate the endotracheal tube and artery forceps for blunt dissection as i said in difficult anatomy cases and mops to uh, prevent the excessive bleeding that can aspirate and lead to complication so we'll see that technique technique it is uh, most of the uh, person will be right handed so if uh, right handed means we have to stand the left side of the patient and if left handed means you can uh, do the other way and we'll stabilize the larynx using the left hand and uh, use the left index finger to identify the trichothyroid membrane and if it is difficult to identify means we'll put a vertical incision of 8 to 10 cm we'll use blunt dissection and we'll find out the trichothyroid membrane then we can puncture the trichothyroid membrane and gain entry into the trachea so holding the scalpel that is we we'll, first we'll hold the scalpel with the right hand that is dominant hand and facing the the cutting edge of the blade will be facing towards us that is the person who is performing that and we'll put a 1 to 2 cm incision over the trichothyroid membrane and after that after that we have to turn the uh, turn the blade so that the cutting edge will be uh, facing the feet of the patient that is the incision will be like this and the, now the scalpel blade will be perpendicular to the incision line that is with that Uh, we know that it is not going to extend the incision or not going to injure any uh, adjunct adjunct structures that we can use it as a uh, for giving traction also we can use it as a control so we will swap hands after turning to the 90 degree and cutting edge facing the feet of the patient we will swap the hands we will hold this scalpel with the left hand and we can use for mental, maintain gentle traction we can use with the left and with the uh, right uh, that is th this picture sorry i'm sorry 
Yes, sir. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, this picture you can see. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, this picture you can see. This is after the incision has been made. It has turned to 90 degree and the cutting edge of the blade is now facing the uh, uh, foot end of the patient. This is the cutting edge. We have incised like this and now the cutting edge is facing the foot end of the patient. And we have swapped the hands and we are holding the scalpel now with the left hand. So we can give a, maintain a gentle traction with this and it is not going to extend the incision also because we have made it perpendicular. So by this technique with the right hand, we can hold the boji and we can pass through the trichothyroid membrane. Pick the boji up with your right hand and holding the boji at a right angle to the trachea, slide the tip of boji down the side of the scalpel blade. That is in the next picture. Next picture. You can see the angle tip of bougie is directed away from the scalpel and then after inserting, we will turn it to, uh, towards the trachea and we will insert it inside the trachea for 10 to 15 centimeters. And after that, we will remove the scalpel. Stabilize the trachea and tension skin with the left hand. Uh, after that, when the bougie is secured in the trachea, we will railroad a, that is, we will put through the bougie a lubricated size 6 cupped tracheal tube over the bougie and uh, we will rotate the tube over the bougie as it is advanced and avoid excessive advancement. And as with the uh, intubation also, if it is uh, excessively advanced, it can go into the uh, broader and wider right bronchus and it can lead to endobronchial intubation. And here we are giving excess pressure also. So endobronchial intubation will be more dangerous than a normal intubation for uh, intubation in case of trichothyrotomy tube. So we have to prevent the uh, excessive advancement. We have check the we have to check the air entry and make it at a uh, adequate length of the tube should be inside the trachea. And after that, once the tube is in position, we can remove the bougie and we can inflate the cuffs and uh, confirm uh, the ventilation or position of the tube with the capnography monitoring. What are the complications of trichothyrotomy? That is, uh, any surgical procedure, the most common complication will be hemorrhage. Next, it is injury to the surrounding structures. So surrounding structures, what it is pre present here will be, it can puncture while uh, putting an incision over the trichothyroid membrane and the anterior part of the trachea, it can cause injury to the posterior tracheal wall also. And it can injure vocal cord, thyroid gland, and esophag esophageal injury is also uh, uh, noted in the studies, is even esophageal injury happened during trichothyrotomy. And placement of the airway cannula in the subcutaneous tissue can result in subcutaneous or mediastinal emphysema. And if it is not in the uh, failure to cannulate the trachea, can, the ventilation won't be uh, occurring for the patient. And incidence for failure to cannulate the trachea ranges from 0 to 40 degree. And also, since we are giving high pressure oxygen, it can lead to barotrauma also. And uh, I have said that pulmonary compliance, if the patient's pulmonary compliance is poor, means this uh, will be a uh, relative contraindication. This can lead to uh, much more worsen uh, uh, compliance. And late complication occurs like uh, granulation or uh, gran granulation at cuff site can occur, swallowing dysfunction, infection will be there. Once it is affecting the nearby vocal cord, means dysphonia, that is change in the sound or uh, uh, vocal cord paralysis can occur. And uh, catheter can kink and effective ventilation won't be there uh, if it is that is it can occur at the as the late complication and tracheal stenosis or tracheal stoma stenosis can occur as a late complication. Incidence is around two to eight percentage. Next technique it is needle trichothyrotomy. It is safe and simple. That is we are not uh, putting any trichothyrotomy tube. We are just putting with the needle over catheter and we are ventilating uh, ventilating the patient. So it is simpler method, but uh, uh, there are some conditions like uh, we have to use only 14 goes or larger catheter because we are using the catheter and we are going to ventilate the patient through this catheter. So adequate ventilation, if adequate tidal volume, we have to give through this smaller diameter thing, we have to give more pressure. So uh, most others recommend a cannula 14 goes or larger to do the medial trichothyrotomy. And small IV cannulas will be getting compressed and prone to kinking. That is, since it is passing through the trichotomy, 
and also it will go inside the trachea. The chance for thinking is there. And if it is thinked, means like endotracheal tube, the airway pressure will be high and we won't be able to ventilate the patient. So uh, the preformed thinking catheter or if we are uh, before this thing itself, we can give a king so that the further king won't occur. And uh, the catheter size, it should be, if it is too short means there is a chance that it can come out through the, uh, the trichothyrotomy spot. And if it is larger means based on the hagen poiseuille loop, the flow will be equal to pi r raised to 4. That is, it is directly proportional to the radius of the uh, tube and it is inversely proportional. Length is coming in the denominator. So, it is inversely proportional to the length of the tube. So, if we are using a larger tube means or uh, longer tube means, the flow will be reduced. So, the, for the adult patient, the ideal length will be keeping will be around 4 cm. And other devices, other than the needle and the syringe set, we can use other devices used for needle trichothyrotomy will be Tuhi needle, uh, which we use to put epidural catheter or vessel dilator in a IV introducer kit, triple lumen CV central venous catheter and suction catheter is also used as a uh, as for needle trichothyrotomy. And how we are going to connect this to a ventilation source means by connectors. By 15 mm connector will be available or uh, lower lock will be available with the syringe itself. It can be uh, it can be connected to the syringe and can connect to the ventilation source. And ventilation techniques, that is the diameter, the catheter diameter we know that even though if we are using 14 gauge or more mean, the catheter diameter is usually very less to ventilate an adequate tidal volume for an adult. So we have to provide a source of high pressure oxygen and robust connections are required. For that, we have to maintain jet ventilation. Jet ventilation is injection of high velocity gas into the airway through a narrow cannula without a C is termed jet ventilation. Usually jet ventilation will be of the cycle that is 60 cycles per minute. And if it is more than the 60 cycles per minute means it can be referred as high frequency jet ventilation. And here is a uh, picture of the jet ventilator. And here we can connect from this, we will be able to connect to the syringe needle trichothyrotomy tube. And this oxy uh, this end, we can connect to the oxygen source in cylinder or to the central supply, we can connect. And we will have a pressure monitor, flow monitor saying how much pressure of air which is going we are pumping to the patient and we have a knob is present to control the uh, flow of the oxygen through the uh, jet ventilator, jet ventilator. In a small patient, we will consider that we will reduce to 5 psi pounds per square inch and we will increase in 5 psi till the adequate chest uh, expansion is observed. And in adult, it should be preset at 25 psi. Then due, uh, by seeing the clinical response, we can either increase or decrease by the 5 psi pressure will decrease. And the upper airway, during this jet ventilation, the upper airway should be made maximally patent. As I told, the jet ventilation, exhalation of the patient occurs through the uh, normal anatomy. Well, if it is complete obstruction means we cannot put a jet ventilation because the, there is no other passage for the uh, ex exhaled air to go out. So, upper airway should be made maximally patent during jet ventilation. And during this, during failed intubation, uh, uh, anesthesiologists have per performed the jet ventilation and due to the aggress or exhalation of the gas, it was used to identify the vocal cord and the success for intubation was higher in patients after jet ventilation. So, it can be used prior to ventilation also in order to occur. And if complete airway obstruction is persist, the airway must be converted to a, to a tracheostomy as soon as possible. That's all about the trichothyrotomy. Thank you for your patient listening. Sir? Yeah. It was an excellent presentation, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ravi, Dr. please. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ravi is there with him. That's why I didn't ask anything. Dr. Ravi, you can continue. Yeah, actually, this uh, topic uh, is a very important topic for uh, everybody, especially for all anesthesiologists going to practice. And it's a very good topic for all PGs, so that they should be able to know what exactly the, the things are needed for the academy. 
by doing the set what are the set is important what it exactly constitutes and next is the, the procedure and another thing is indication and content indication and everyone should know the complications that is more important and i think in this uh, topic has been well covered by dr nazir so if any doubts please anybody can any questions please be welcome Dr. Mansur, you have mentioned that the thyroidectomy, uh, sorry, hypothyroidectomy uh, is usually done by an anesthesiologist, and uh, tracheostomy is done by a surgeon. Uh, actually, nowadays all our anesthesiologists are well versed with our percutaneous tracheostomy. I don't, I, I don't think anyone will leave their procedure to surgeon. Uh, I, I have mentioned, mentioned that now it is getting more popular to surgical trichothyrotomy such as among anesthesiologists also. Since we were uh, that is we used to perform this central venous cannulation by the Seldinger method, we were uh, I mean we are more uh, okay with the uh, percutaneous dilatation method. But now the yeah yeah, so the, yeah, yeah, yeah I agree with you. If the see for trichothyrotomy also uh, we are using the dilatation method and for the um, uh, percutaneous tracheostomy we are, we are doing the same method only only the thing is that the space is different that's all and we are routinely doing it so uh, tracheostomy is no uh, tracheostomy is nowadays tracheostomy is not mean for surgery or the, we we don't require any surgeon or ENT surgeon for uh, performing a tracheostomy. Now it is now all our anesthesiologists, almost all our anesthesiologists are doing percutaneous tracheostomy. That's all I want to mention. Yes, uh, Rajesh, sir, any, any other questions from yours, sir? No, it's uh, percutaneous trichothyrotomy is uh, mainly a uh, emergency procedure, no? It's not an elective procedure. No, percutaneous uh, trichothyrotomy is an elective procedure. At the same time, uh, percutaneous tracheostomy is elective procedure. Yeah. So percutaneous tracheostomy, bedside, uh, many of the anesthesiologists are doing, especially those in the critical care setup. So anyway, he has presented well. Very good presentation. You are first year? Yes, sir. You are first year or second year? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Devi, for uh, uh, mentoring the student also. Thank you, sir. Just I would like to add some more points regarding this. Uh, Please. So, as we said, is the incidence rate, uh, like uh, because karatami may be around 0.2 or 0.3 percent per the like, uh, incidence rate. So, in periphery, especially in periphery, we don't know how much we are able to, uh, able to do this. And availability of the set is also very important. So overall, this is a, and uh, we would like to give an idea to everybody, the uh, like what students and all. If uh, if not being done in their uh, lifetime, or the academic uh, attempts or anything not being done, no experience in that. At least they should be having the theoretical knowledge. At least in emergency, when they can't able to intubate or they can't able to ventilate, at least they should be able to remember and do this uh, sending and technique, percutaneous sending technique, so that they should be able to save the patient. So that was uh, one of the uh, motto we must always keep in uh, uh, our conscious level so that uh, we can save the patient, especially peripheral sectors. Uh, as the critical care sector, uh, people are having everything so that they can make it uh, in place of uh, available resources. But peripheral uh, setup really is very difficult to get the, all these things. So in that setup, at least if they got this theoretical knowledge, they'll be, they can be able to uh, save the patient life. So this is one of the one. Uh, uh, this one we have to take uh, take home message, especially the practitioners or the PDs in future. If they don't have further sector to practice, they should have this message in their back of the mind before uh, they uh, starting their uh, practices in future. And it's one of the important uh, topic for even exams. If anybody is a short question or main question to ask, they should be able to write. So actually, this topic was uh, given like a before academy said, but we covered even procedure too. So that it, it can be able to give a complete idea about the set as well as for the procedure. So this was our intention. Paul Sir which gave us the opportunity to, uh, to present this session for my our PGs, first year PGs. So thank you very much for uh, providing this platform for, for PGs and to us. Thank you, sir.
Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rebig, uh, he has very extensively presented uh, and he covered all the topics, all the areas of the Krakatai uh, Rotomy. And it was very good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shamshad, madam. And uh, I think, uh, Dr. V, uh, shall we move to our second presentation? Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, hello. Dr. Devi, you can introduce the speaker. Uh, actually, the topic will be presented by Dr. Zina Bharata. She is our first LPG from Mama Medical Hospital. She is going to present a topic about dobutamine and dopamine, which are both uh, important drugs for every anesthesialist, especially who should know about the pharmacology of this drug, so that every day, day to day, we are using these drugs. So we must, every PGs should have this knowledge about these two drugs, like uh, when to use, how to use, and uh, when not to use. So these are the things we are going to cover in, in this topic today. And uh, my PG is going to present. Uh, I'm handing over to Dr. Uh, Regina, please Dr. Regina, please. Thank you, sir. I have the screen. Share on the screen. Yes, sir. We are signing. Sir, uh, is it screen is yeah, visible to everybody? Yeah, your screen is visible. Perfect. Please, sir. Right. 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 Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Bijna Baradan, first year PG resident, Department of Anesthesiology, Malabar Medical College, Colorado. Uh, first, I thank everyone uh, in Kerala uh, ISA uh, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, my, I am uh, presenting the topic uh, dopamine and dopamine. So uh, I will be covering uh, in uh, the subheadings, uh, introduction, mechanism of action, pharmacokinetics, therapeutic uses, dosages, contraindications, and the adverse effects. So first, about the drug dopamine. Uh, dopamine is an endogenous catecholamine. Uh, it is an immediate precursor of noradrenaline. It regulates cardiac, vascular, and endocrine function. And it's an important neurotransmitter in the central and peripheral nervous system. It acts on dopaminergic as well as adrenergic receptors. And uh, uh, dobutamine, it is a synthetic catecholamine. So first about synthesis of dopamine. Uh, dopamine is uh, synthesized from phenylalanine. In uh, the first step, uh, take place in the work. And uh, phenylalanine is converted into tyrosine by the enzyme of uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase. Then this uh, and, uh, tyrosine is transmitted to adrenergic neuronal cytoplasm. From there, tyrosine is converted into DOPA by an enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate-limiting step of the uh, reaction. 
then the dopa is converted into dopamine by do dopa decarboxylase enzyme then the dopa dopamine will enter the uh, vesicles and inside the vesicle it is uh, converted into noradrenaline by beta hydroxylase and then noradrenaline in the adrenal medulla cells is converted into adrenaline by n methyl transferase and the rate limiting step is second step when the tyrosine is converted into dopamine uh, which is uh, uh, catalyzed by hydroxylase uh, tyrosine hydroxylase in that. next about uh, receptor physiology uh, the dopamine as i already said it acts on dopamine dopaminergic receptors as well as adrenergic receptor uh, dopamine uh, dopaminergic receptors are mainly uh, in uh, distributed in renal sphagnic coronary and cerebral bed and uh, it is having a dose dependent action and it can induce noradrenaline release Uh, next about the alpha 1 receptor which is located in the vascular walls and it induces significant vasoconstriction and it also present in heart and it causes increase in duration of contraction next is beta 1 receptor it causes increase in ionotropy increases chronotropy and minimal vasoconstriction on beta 2 receptor uh, it is located in the uh, blood vessels and it causes vasodilatation and it increases lactate and glucose level so about the mechanism of action of dopamine it acts on dopaminergic d1 d2 and uh, adrenergic alpha and beta receptor the d1 receptors in the renal and uh, mesenteric blood vessels are most sensitive and it has a dose dependent action so in low doses like 0.1 to 0.5 to 3 microgram per kilogram per minute it primarily stimulate d1 and d2 receptors and causes dilatation of vessels decrease in arterial blood pressure and increased renal and sphagnic blood flow and it also causes diuresis and natriuresis by acting on the proximal tubules and causing uh, excretion of sodium next is moderate high dose uh, that is uh, dose between 3 to 10 microgram per kilogram per minute uh, it is having a positive ionotropic action and uh, the direct act on it directly act on beta 1 and uh, d1 uh, receptor and it is having little chronological effect and it induces norepinephrine release from sympathetic neurons in higher doses uh, like more than 10 microgram per kilogram per minute it predominantly stimulate alpha 1 receptor leads to vasoconstriction increase the systemic vascular resistance and increase in blood pressure so there is a wide range of clinical response observed in uh, in observed due to individual variability in pharmacokinetics of the dopamine and these differences are uh, profound in critically in patients uh, due to changes in the circulating protein and the volume of distribution so the drug must be titrated uh, to the effect Uh, dopamine is metabolized rapidly in an elimination half life of 1 to 2 minutes and it is used as a continuous infusion to maintain thera therapeutic plasma concentration and like norepinephrine extra uh, dopamine also causes extravasation and produces intense local vasoconstriction and uh, dopamine is not effective orally and it does not cross blood brain barrier so uh, next uh, it causes a uh, it is uh, partially protein bound and uh, 25 percentage of uh, total dopamine is converted into norepinephrine uh, it undergo metabolism in liver and it is excreted through urine in kidneys uh, dose and administration uh, the commercial preparation of dopamine are uh, concentrated drug solution and it is available in 40 mg dopamine hydrochloride per ml and uh, 5 ml and 10 ml vials are available and we should dilute uh, should be used uh, should be diluted to prevent intense vasoconstriction before uh, before use and uh, uh, it should be delivered to large central veins 
then indications uh, first uh, it is uh, adjunct to other inotrope uh, it is uh, used in symptomatic bradycardia which is unresponsive to atropine or pacing in cardiogenic shock in septic shock and in congestive cardiac failure but in uh, in septic shock norepinephrine is more preferred than uh, preferred over dopamine adverse effects of dopamine it causes tachyarrhythmia which is the most common adverse effect it also causes malignant tachyarrhythmia such as uh, multifocal ventricular ectopic ventricular tachycardia and uh, as i already said dopamine uh, extra vessage from the uh, vessels so it dopamine causes uh, limb necrosis and uh, to treat that uh, we can give uh, injection of fentolamine and then it also causes allergic reaction uh, there is uh, if, uh, the dopamine causes delay in gastric emptying in con during continuous infusion and uh, it can also cause increasing intraocular pressure uh, in uh, the effect of effect on ventilation is it can cause depression of uh, ventilation and the arterial oxygen saturation can uh, get uh, reduced so we should uh, check the uh, uh, patient's abg uh, when uh, this patient is on a continuous infusion uh, in a ventilator patient and uh, by uh, it uh, it decreases arterial oxygen saturation mainly by ventilation perfusion mismatch and it also causes hyperglycemia due to inhibition of insulin secretion the limitations of uh, dopamine are it is less potent than adrenaline and noradrenaline and in the larger doses it can cause tachycardia and vasoconstriction it is contraindicated in patient on uh, mao a inhibitors a mao inhibitor uh, patients uh, on uh, having pheochromocytoma uh, uncorrected tachyarrhythmia and uh, ventricular fibrillation Um, so just a comparison of uh, action of dopamine and dobutamine uh, on different uh, receptors in alpha one uh, dopamine having this uh, action on alpha one uh, when the uh, dose is on higher side that is uh, it is more than 10 microgram per kilogram per minute and dobutamine is also having a uh, little bit action on alpha one uh, but when uh, the dobutamine is considered uh, it is mainly a uh, selective beta one agonist and uh, dopamine uh, it's uh, having beta 1 and beta 2 receptor in the moderate dose that is 5 to 10 microgram per kilogram per minute and uh, uh, dopamine uh, having do uh, action on dopaminergic receptors even in lower dose these are all about uh, my first drug uh, that is dopamine next is dobutamine dobutamine is a synthetic catecholamine which is derived from isoprotein and it acts through beta 1 and beta receptor and it is a, a more selective beta 1 action so the action is uh, like in 3 to 1 ratio uh, then mechanism of action of dobutamine it's directly stimulate the adrenergic receptor and causes stimulation of adrenal cyclase activity leads to increase in intracellular cyclic amp and it does not release it does not cause release of norepinephrine uh dobutamine as a potent inotrope with a weak chronotropic activity uh, it uh, increases cardiac output by increasing stroke volume and it uh, decreases uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh the mild vaso it causes mild vasodilatation at the lower doses uh in uh, less than 5 microgram per kilogram per minute inotropy without uh, it causes inotropy without uh, increasing systemic vascular resistance and which is seen up to 15 microgram per kilogram per minute uh, then in higher doses it causes increasing systemic vascular resistance as its alpha 1 action predominates it increases chronotropy leads to increase in oxygen demand or consumption and also limits its utility it is useful in cardiogenic shock uh, in high pulmonary arterial pressure and in right right ventricular dysfunction and it does not affect dopaminergic receptor dobutamine also causes significant increase in heart rate and cardiac output uh, there is no myocardial relaxation so uh, it's a poor choice for patient having severe diastolic failure 
and uh, it does not cause any change in pulmonary arterial pressure and ventricular afterload. So uh, it is a poor choice for patient uh, having severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, in uh, mean arterial pressure and uh, systemic vascular resistance remain unchanged. And uh, in uh, the patients, uh, patient with the post cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, there is a reduced catecholamine sensitivity. So the action of uh, dopamine or dopamine effect is reduced. Next is pharmacokinetics of uh, dobutamine. Uh, its onset of action is within two minutes and its peak plasma concentration of drug is achieved within 10 minutes after initiation of infusion. And it is metabolized in liver and excreted through kidney. Uh, dosages are 10 to 20 microgram per kilogram per minute and we can give up to maximum of 40 microgram per kilogram per minute. And uh, the available in vial containing uh, 250 microgram per 20 ml, and it must be diluted prior to use and given IV only. Indications of dobutamine: it's a uh, uh, used for ionotropic support and in uh, open heart surgery. It is uh, used as an alternative alternative to exercise in cardiac stress testing. Then in symptomatic bradycardia, which is unresponsive to atropine or pacing. In uh, patients with a low cardiac output, uh, having compensated cardiac failure, uh, cardiogenic shock, sepsis into the myocardial infarction, we can use the glutamine. Contraindications are, uh, it is hyper, uh, hypersensitive, if the patient is having hypersensitivity to glutamine, then patient having pheochromocytoma, then uh, the recent myocardial infarction history, unstable angina, patient uh, having stenosis of main pulmonary, uh, main coronary artery, and the uh, patient on heart failure. Disadvantages of uh, the vitamin is, uh, it uh, causes tolerance, uh, it causes malignant ventricular arrhythmias, tachycardia, ventricular arrhythmias, cardiac ischemia, and hypotension. Uh, uh, if uh, in uh, overdose, it can cause nausea, vomiting, tremor, headache, chest pain, excessive hypertension, and tachycardia. Uh, it's uh, uh, just a comparison of uh, brief of both dopamine and dobutamine. Uh, the source of dopamine is a, it is a natural catecholamine and it is a precursor of norepinephrine. Uh, in dobutamine, it is a synthetic catecholamine and it does not uh, release norepinephrine. Mechanism of action, dopamine uh, has an action on adrenergic as well as dopaminergic receptor. And uh, uh, in dobutamine, it has pure adrenergic receptor and uh, it is more of selective beta-1 agonist. Action on beta uh, BP blood pressure, uh, the dopamine increases blood, blood pressure and it is uh, more of a sustained increase. And uh, the dopamine can uh, increase or neutral effect or it can decrease the blood pressure. Uh, effect of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, there is no favorable effect uh, on uh, do dopamine, but uh, in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure can reduce, optimize or favorable on uh, uh, by using dobutamine. Effects on renal blood flow and diuresis. Dopamine improves at low dose by direct action and uh, dobutamine uh, has no direct action and it may improve uh, due to improved cardiac function. Then arrhythmogenicity, uh, both dopamine and dobutamine has, uh, effect, uh, can cause arrhythmia, but uh, dopamine uh, has a less chance of uh, dobutamine. Uh, then ionotropic effect, uh, the more uh, and consistent ionotropic effect. Uh, dobutamine is having more and consistent ionotropic effect and uh, do uh, dopamine is having less ionotropic effect. Uh, in a shock, cardiac, uh, shock, we prefer dopamine over dobutamine. In cardiac failure, we prefer dobutamine over uh, dopamine. In ischemic left ventricular failure, we prefer dobutamine over dopamine. And in renal failure, we prefer uh, dopamine over dobutamine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Please, Dr. Ravi, please. Yes, sir. Is, uh, like dopamine and dopamine, these are the two important drugs for every anesthesialist. So, as I said in the initial beginning of the class, 
their mental is how to is the matter is we have three concept we had always in mind and we should use these drugs and as this dopamine is a play uh, or is a secreting which are the body of the human beings and dopamine is a synthetic drug so these are the one we should know like where exactly we should use and indication is very simple that we had always come to where you need anotropic and chronotropic there dopamine should be used where you use only that anotropic then we must go for dopamine so the conditions which are leading to the uh, expecting for us to use indication is where we need increase in the heart rate as well as uh, increase in stroke volume or cardiac contraction there the dopamine is we can use in both conditions whereas if you want to use only for increasing cardiac contraction there dopamine should be used so these two things you have to keep in mind at the pages and you must uh, use these drugs uh, as a indication as indicated conditions and another thing you must always think uh, like keep in mind of the combinations of these two drugs so arithmetic is the one you must always keep in mind and whenever you using the, the dosage and the tolerance especially the dopamine as you use uh, the drug more and more it causes a more tolerance so we cannot use for uh, uh, continuous with for Uh, more than some certain uh, doses, so this you have to keep in mind. So these are the important things we should keep for practical tips when we are using these two drugs. So any questions or any doubts, please. Thank you, Doctor Ravi. And we have a few couple of questions in the chat box. We can take up that questions now. And Vijna, please take over. One. Uh, in icu uh, an anesthesiologist only do the percutaneous tracheostomy it was a comment okay ah uh, yeah usually and uh, if uh, tracheostomy elective tracheostomy usually if, uh, if a call comes to anesthesiologist means he only will do the tracheostomy percutaneous tracheostomy we agree with that and uh, we don't have jet ventilator how can we do go ahead with ventilation so for an elective uh, patient uh, what is the what what is the need of a jet ventilator i think the uh, look i'll do one thing i'll allow unmute to dr rajini dr rajini you can uh, un unmute and ask the question because uh, for elective procedure we don't need a jet ventilator usually percutaneous tracheostomy is performed in a elective ventilated patient so what we used to do is we used to just uh, readjust the tube and we do the tracheostomy uh, uh, hello sir questions ah uh, yeah please uh sir i was talking about uh, emergency tracheotomy emergency tracheotomy and uh, use of uh, uh, jet ventilator if we don't have jet ventilator in peripheral setups especially how do we go ahead with the jet that ventilation complete, that i uh, completely do agree with you because uh, for the emergency procedure we we do need uh, we, we do need to uh, ventilate the patient but for, I, i was telling about the elective procedure okay i agree with you so the president i can suggest you if you got a brain circuit and all, definitely we can give the we can use organ flash and if it's not all different it's not all we can use the brain circuit for providing emergency oxygenation to the patient by using the oxygen flash okay that can provide you with the high flow and we can manage up to certain time uh, situation till we can uh, establish the definitive end this is the one thing we can try Uh, uh will the uh, uh, 2 liter bag uh, ventilation uh, hold that much of pressure through a small uh, uh, diameter needle i mean catheter <laughs> that, i was confused about that is looking all well at least uh, available resources we can replace it that was my intention it's not that it's going to replace the jet ventilator yeah okay oh. Thank you. Surgical, uh, can I speak? Surgical uh, cricothoracotomy. Uh, like you can always put the endotracheal tube. No, uh, like uh, you are putting over the uh, over the bougie. So you can easily ventilate with that. Uh, as you rightly said, with the needle, it will be difficult. Uh, you can easily ventilate. Yeah, Doctor Paul, because uh, the presentation itself, she showed that we can use six number. Um, uh, he she showed yeah. he showed six, six number six, uh, endotracheal uh, tube. Two. No, the question of uh, Dr. Dejini whether uh, whether we'll be able to ventilate with that. Definitely, with the endotracheal tube, it, it will be uh, easier to ventilate, and uh, there will not be any issues. We, uh, we all have uh, most of us uh, would have the experience uh, with that. But with the needle, with the needle, it will be it, it will be uh, difficult. 
yeah yes sir that's what i meant okay and uh, shall i move on to other question the second one is low dose dopamine causing natiuretics etc no more used and isoprenal is usually prefer, preferred for bradycardia not uh, responding to atropine that is another question from dr narayan see as per aha protocol still adrenaline infusion and uh, um, dopamine infusion is there for treating bradycardia bradycardia protocol it is there still it is there what was the question uh, dr pinel L- uh, low dose dopamine causing natiuretics that is first question no and it's not no more use that we can also agree uh, yeah. uh, do- three three my three my uh, um, uh, dopamine three. dose of uh, this thing and uh, diuretic dose of dopamine now, nowadays we are not considering we agree with that isoprenal is usually preferred to bradycardia not responding to atropine that is the second point he mentioned that only i, I am just countering that's all Okay, okay. We can use isoprenalin that is there, but uh, as per AHA protocol, the uh, 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 dopamine infusion is also there. Dopamine and epinephrine infusion; those are the uh, drugs which is uh, advocated by American Heart Association, as rightly said by Dr. Binel, as an infusion. And. any other questions uh, you can unmute and ask expecting comment from the senior faculties dr rajesh no comments uh, but uh, she also presented well uh, thank you dr bijina and uh, dr ravi and uh, all the best for your exams also for both students and to dr bijna i think you have presented the doses of dopamine also no different doses of dopamine is there yes sir yes sir so once one, someone is asking we have to show again that's why i just asked so this is the dosage of the document yeah thank you you can just read out once more if it's possible yeah please yeah so dopamine is having a uh, adrenergic as well as a dopaminergic action and uh, in uh, lower doses uh, like uh, less than 2 uh, microgram per kilogram per minute uh, it acts on um, dopaminergic receptors d1 and d2 and uh, in the moderate dose in 5 to 10 microgram per kilogram per minute it acts on beta 1 and beta receptor and uh, when in used in higher doses uh, it is having a predominant alpha 1 action and it causes mass of constriction in uh, alpha 1 So here I would like to add one more point regarding these doses. What are maybe like two to twenty microgram per kg per minute is the, the maximum dose you can. Sometimes it has been reduced up to fifty microgram per kg per minute. But clinically we are using maximum like twenty microgram per kg. Per that is the dosage about that it may cause more adverse effects. So it has been it has been using clinically for maximum twenty microgram per kg per minute. So depending upon the doses, two microgram to five microgram, then five to ten from ten to twenty. These are the one we are going to get uh, different effects of dopamine for uh, achieving our anaerobic uh, or chronotropic effects. So that has been discussed in this class. Doctor Bijana, is it still used at uh, 0.5 microgram per kilogram body weight uh, for diuresis and natriuresis? At present, it is not sir. Actually, yeah. it is. Yeah. that 
and uh, another question since uh, dopamine is a venodilator it should be used with the noradrenaline infusion yeah of course we can combine noradrenaline with the dopamine um, um, uh, sorry dobutamine it's not an issue okay. and you can get the positive effect of both uh, dobutamine and um, noradrenaline so you know we never use here definitely we we'll take it as a Yeah, 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 you will get excellent effect if if if, if, if it is indicated. I used Thank to you. do dobutamine along with um, um, uh, noradrenaline. I am Doctor Narayan, sir. Can you speak for a minute? Yeah, please. Okay, actually, I have worked in cardiac anesthesia for eight years. So, yeah, two things: the isoprenaline. Uh, is uh, very commonly used in among the cardiac people, but what the thing is, yeah, ACC ACC says dopamine slash adrenaline. So we always go for adrenaline whenever we are not going to get the effect of atropine. Most of the time, the dopamine doesn't affect, doesn't act. So that is a practical thing which can be a little different from whatever ACC is. Can you switch off your video and speak? Uh, yeah. Breaking sir. your voice is breaking. Okay. Uh, am I better now? Yeah, you are yeah, audible. Yeah. You are audible now. okay uh, one thing is that uh, that was a common probably it is not a this thing about isoprenaline dopamine slash adrenaline of course adrenaline is definitely used till now uh, whenever uh, atropine uh, is not effective then you go to either isoprenaline or adrenaline that's what you practically do the other thing is uh, regarding the contraindication for dobutamine so it's a very strong contraindication uh, af is a very strong contra contraindication we do see people on dobutamine if they go into af especially post cardiac surgery they quickly sometimes get converted to vf so it is not mentioned many times but if you see the dobutamine vials most of the literature will uh, tell it as probably one of the most important or sole contraindication so af is a very important contraindication for dobutamine sir so that is my other thing thank you very much thank you sir Vinil, any more questions? Otherwise, no, I got no more questions in the chat box. Any of the participants, if they want to ask any questions, they can ask now. Nothing, no. Nothing. So over to Shamshad, madam. Please. Waiting okay. for your questions. Uh, yes. Congratulations to uh, Dr. Ravi as well as uh, Dr. Paul for training the first year students to present like this. They have done almost all the parts. They have covered, and they have nicely presented. 